वेलकम टू मेडिकल डायलॉग्स जर्नल क्लब आई एम डॉक्टर नंदिता मोहन एंड हियर इज व्हाट आई हैव फॉर यू टुडे कोविड वेरिएंट्स आर म्यूटेटिंग एंड इट इज स्टिल अ ग्लोबल थ्रेट इररेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ द टाइप ऑफ वेरिएंट एंड इट्स रेप्लिकेशन पोटेंशियल द साइटोकाइन स्टॉर्म व्हिच एक्चुअली नीड्स टू बी एड्रेस्ड विद प्रॉम्प्टनेस कंट्रीब्यूट्स टू द अल्टीमेट सीवियरिटी ऑफ द इलनेस Now this cytokine storm is characterized by the abnormal release of the circulating cytokines causing several adverse reactions. So the study that I'm going to talk about today it aimed to evaluate the effect of itolizumab on clinical outcomes of patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 disease those who have been admitted to the intensive care unit. The primary aim of the study was to find out any mortality benefit in 14 days. while the secondary aim was to assess the morbidity outcomes in terms of reduction in inflammatory markers and also the duration of the hospital stays a retrospective case control study included a total of around 62 patients out of which 31 patients received itolizumab and 31 of them didn't receive who were categorized as controls among the total patients who were recruited 68% of the study populations were males and 32% were females a total of 12 patients expired among the cases and 13 expired among the controls so all these results cumulatively showed that the overall mortality in both the groups was noted to be almost similar there was also a significant reduction in inflammatory markers like interleukin 6 and d dimer in cases compared to the control group hence the researchers concluded that treating patients with cytokine storms before they require any intubation or a mechanical ventilation is crucial to preventing deaths itolizumab has shown no clinical benefit in critically ill covid-19 patients however the timely initiation of itolizumab therapy may actually serve as a key therapeutic option in preventing the mortality and morbidity outcomes in moderate to severe covid-19 patients that's all for today stay tuned to medical dialogues for latest updates hello and welcome to medical dialogues journal club i am dr nandita mohan and here is what i have for you today it is known that intravenous immunoglobin is an established treatment for many immune mediated disorders now the study that i'm talking about presents a case report of two individuals highlighting a potentially serious but under recognized side effect of intravenous immunoglobin therapy a 67 year old female with no pertinent past medical history presented with a 3 day history of acute onset progressive quadriparesis with intact bladder bowel functions global airflexia on neurological examination with intact sensations along with the nerve conduction studies suggestive of motor demyelinating polyneuropathy and albuminocytological dissociation in the csf examination led to the diagnosis of guillain barre syndrome the doctors administered this intravenous immunoglobin therapy for 5 days she received approximately 170 grams of the intravenous immunoglobin Although her limb weakness stabilized she did develop acutely progressive anemia on the 9th day and her hemoglobin dropped to 8 g per deciliter a day later the peripheral smear revealed 2 to 3 nucleated rbcs white blood cells and abundant polychromatophils her direct antiglobin test was negative on two occasions she was transfused with one unit of packed o red blood cells her hemoglobin improved thereafter to 11.2 and her reticulocyte also dropped to 2% on the 24th day after this initiation therapy the second report that i'm talking is of a 20 year old male with no again significant past medical history this person presented with a 4 day history of acute onset progressive motor quadriparesis without any bladder bowel involvement neurological examination revealed global airflexia and intact sensations motor demyelinating polyneuropathy in the nerve conduction studies and albuminocytological dissociation in the csf examination favored again the diagnosis of guillain barre syndrome the team infused total intravenous immunoglobin dose of 140 g over 5 days he developed an acute onset anemia as like the previous one with a rapid drop in the hemoglobin level to 7.7 this happened on the 10th day of initiating intravenous immunoglobin the rise in the indirect bilirubin and serum ldh along with peripheral smears shows nucleated rbcs and polychromasia favoring hemolysis Thereafter his hemoglobin further improved to 11.8 on 24th day after the initiation therapy. So keeping these two reports in mind the researchers concluded that these case studies did highlight a potentially serious 
but under recognized side effect of intravenous immunoglobin therapy it is important that medical practitioners are aware of this adverse effect for early recognition and management that's all for today stay tuned to medical dialogues for latest updates hello and welcome to medical dialogues journal club i am dr nandita mohan and here is what i have for you today Several cross-sectional studies worldwide have reported a higher prevalence of hypogonadism among males with diabetes mellitus. The association between hypogonadism and diabetes has recently been drawing public health attention. Hypogonadism as we all know it as low levels of testosterone has been classically linked with sexual dysfunction, but recent data shows that it is also linked with insulin resistance, obesity, metabolic syndrome, incident diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, depression as well as a poor quality of life. Now despite all of these few studies on hypogonadism in newly onset diabetes mellitus are done from the eastern part of India. So the authors carried out a cross sectional study to know the magnitude of the problem and also the predictor of hypogonadism in this part of India as ethnicity and lifestyle vary from region to region a total of 231 consecutive newly diagnosed males with type 2 diabetes were enrolled patients were stratified into two groups group A that is hypogonadal and group B that was eugonadal based on the testosterone levels the mean value of age the BMI the HbA1c the waist circumference high density lipoprotein systolic blood pressure diastolic blood pressure the uric acid as well as the glomerular filtration rate in group A and group B were compared it was then found that the prevalence of hypogonadism was 38.53% hence it was concluded that the prevalence of hypogonadism is high in newly diagnosed diabetes mellitus patients BMI the central obesity as well as the triglyceride levels are significantly associated with low testosterone levels so obese and hypertriglyceride patients should be evaluated for testosterone levels at the time of their diagnosis these patients should be treated with drugs that promote weight loss reduce their insulin resistance and also raise the testosterone levels that's all for today stay tuned to medical dialogues for latest updates never miss a medical update from medical dialogues like subscribe and press the bell icon